Bruce Sterling, who's sitting over there, he's, he's still thinking about what he's going to say. He's an amazing man. So when I graduated from college as a young poet, and I, I published my first book of poems. I spent a, a, a couple of years doing what young poets do when they published a book, is you get in your car and you drive around from university to university giving readings and trying to sell your book. And you spend a lot of time on other people's couches. In those days, there weren't masters of fine arts programs. It was basically poets taking, take, teaching English. And every now and then, I found myself sharing a living room or a couple of couches with another group of writers in the United States. I was writing about art and science at times, and so I would be sometimes brought uh, into the same room with some really amazing people, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Frank Herbert, for example. And there are other people whose names you might not recognize now unless you're, you know, unless you're science fiction readers, but uh, Frederick Pohl, Paul Anderson, Roger Zlasny, Damon Knight, Kate Wilhelm. So the poets were, and are, I'm still one, fun to hang out with. We're smart, we're passionate. Sometimes we're, even if we're David Abel, erudite. But the science fiction writers blew your mind. They were the shock troops of the future. <laughs> they just simply saw further ahead than anybody else I've ever met. Not just in astrobiology and particle physics, but in, in art, anthropology, politics, amazing people. And today, I still get to be sitting in the same room occasionally with friends who are science fiction writers. Uh, and they include Ur Ursula K. Le Guin, Kim Stanley Robinson. Stan has a great couch, by the way, very comfortable. <laughs> and Bruce Sterling. Bruce, um, how many of you in the room have read anything by Bruce Sterling? Yeah, well, those of you who hadn't, start. Uh, Bruce is an award-winning, a Hugo Award-winning uh, science fiction author who helped start the cyberpunk movement. He's an editor and a critic, a designer, a blogger with an international following who teaches media and design at the European Graduate School. The thing about Bruce is he believes in science fiction as a literature of ideas, which is perfect for us because we are a museum of ideas. You'll find a short story about Nevada and the Anthropocene uh, in the Late Harvest book. It marks, it demarcates uh, where the Late Harvest catalog and ex uh, exhibition essays end and where the program for the conference begins, which is perfect. And now he's going to close our morning with his take on what we've been talking about and the post-humanist musings. Bruce, thank you. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, and it's lovely to be back. It's a good thing, tree and alas, you know, you like show up every three years, you feel like an instant veteran. <laughs> and my hair is much grayer now, and I was, uh, you know, happy to see the spectacular show upstairs. Of course, I had seen some of the images of the show because I was writing a science fiction piece for the book of the show, but uh, uh, in person, they are really startling and their scale, very, very impressive. So, um, you know, I, I would love to summarize what you've been up to this morning, but you know, every time I face your community, you know, which is a very creatively refreshing community, the land art community, actually stretches my mind and exciting and new dimensions. Uh, every time I confront you, I, I feel a need to emotionally unburden myself. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but, you know, I, I just have to confess. So uh, I, I didn't bring even a single slide. And instead, I want to talk about some recent projects that I've been involved with that I think are similar to the sort of thing you've been doing. And they're, they're aligned to your efforts, so sort of part of your zeitgeist, whether you know it or not. So uh, this uh, book here, which is a, um, it's a proof copy. I think the book's now, this is my most recently published science fiction story, uh, which is in a collection of science fiction stories, which is called Hieroglyph, uh, which uh, comes from Arizona State University. It's actually a science fiction collection, which was put together by a group at the University of um, Arizona State University called the Center for Science and the Imagination. So, uh, you know, what is my story about? Why do I trouble you with it? Well, you know, my story is called Tall Tower, and it's really kind of land art fiction. I mean, it's about a very tall future tower, uh, which is the tallest possible object that the human race can build with earthly materials. Just a tower about a couple of miles high, made out of structural steel. Um, and it's a gigantic science fictional imaginary monument 
made of steel which exists in the American desert southwest. That's the tall tower. But I didn't make up the idea of the tall tower. It was actually invented by my colleague, Neil Stevenson, who uh, is the inspiration of this book. And Neil had a, um, he had a, you know, a, a science fictional, uh, what's the right word for it, apotheosis. And he wrote, a, uh, he wrote an essay well known in my field, uh, which is called Innovation Starvation, in which he complains that our society uh, no longer embraces gigantic Apollo-style programs and uh, you know, needs, a, needs a, a, larger, <coughs> a larger kind of thinking, you know, just a, um, an Apollo project-style inspirational wild idea, which, uh, which uh, Neil calls hieroglyphs. He sees them as, as kind of visionary memes to kind of move the public from the stasis of the uh, current depression. Uh, and uh, so his idea of the tall tower is intended to sort of capture the public imagination. But it wasn't merely that. He decided that he would also do field work. So it actually is very tied in with the themes of your morning here, which are the post-human geoesthetics and field work. You know, and I, I was surprised to realize that, but that's basically what my story is about, those three themes, the geoesthetics of a very tall tower, just like, what does it look like? And there's many sort of rapturous descriptions in my story about how it makes its own weather and it has unusual architecture in it and so forth and so on. Uh, and the, uh, the post-human is a big theme in this story and I'll get to that later. But then the other part is the field work, which for us science fiction writer usually means going out and messing with scientists or, you know, or engineers. I mean, we'll, we're, periodically we go out and trouble them and try and figure out what's, go what's actually going on on the ground and kind of test our fantastic notions of robots, you know, zombies. Yeah, you know, we, 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 we try to have the occasional, you know, uh, hands-on contact with, uh, with the scientific method because it kind of, uh, it's, it is the grain of the material and it's kind of like playing tennis with the net up. So that's what we, in fact, did at the Center for Science and the Imagination. They were going well out of their way to connect us science fiction writers online and also through some conferences and projects with scientists and engineers actually working at Arizona State University so that you have this kind of, um, you know, fest shrift or kind of a collaborative world building effort. Uh, you know, some of it's visible in the stories which were written by 20 science fiction writers, including myself, but a lot of it is sort of the invisible discussion that was just happening between people who were becoming kind of soy descent colleagues online and kind of tackling these issues and, you know, describing what it might be like and what are the implications and so forth and so on. And, you know, that's a, a, that's a very contemporary thing, I think. And the Center for Science and the Imagination is not a million light years away from the Center for Art and the Environment, any more than Phoenix is like a million miles away from Reno. On the contrary, there's actually some kind of southwestern sensibility happening here, it seems to me. Uh, and the uh, resulting stories, even though they are written by people from all over the world, you know, I happen to be from Texas, so I'm kind of vaguely southwestern, but but they have a very Arizonan flavor, I think, and, and you know, and somehow uh, this effort bears the uh, it bears the marks of uh, Arizona State as an institution very strongly, even though there's nothing in it about the university. There's no sort of rah rah, our football team is great, go Sun Devils. You know, there, 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 there's none of the you know common patriotic rubbish of a state-supported university. It's just that as a center for creativity, they've like actually put together this project and it, it seems to work. It's been you know, well received critically, uh, at least in the science fiction field. People kind of enjoy it you know, and they're, they're happy to see this kind of, um, this kind of creative effort and I, I think they'd like to see more of them. Uh, so you know, my story is about this geoesthetic object and uh, you know, the tall tower when I write about it is already 200 years old. And it, all the sense of sci-fi innovation has rubbed off of it. And it's instead become a historic icon. It's something like Mount Rushmore, which was a technical miracle at the time, but it's now something we get all warmly sentimental about. So the hero of my story is a Arizona cowboy, a guy with a horse. He's uh, you know, kind of a costume cowboy and a sharp operator. 
And uh, he knows that people go to this tower in order to be launched into outer space. And they don't come back. And in fact, that's a killer application for a two mile high tower. You can just sort of build a rifle barrel in it, Jules Verne style, and start shooting people right out through the stratosphere. It's actually kind of a cool sci-fi hack. But by the time my hero arrives, this has become like a time-honored American tradition. It's already kind of a couple of centuries old. And it's become extremely common for people to volunteer to be fired into outer space where they go and live in post-human conditions. They just put off, put aside all earthly ties, and they become post-human beings kind of floating around with extended life spans. They're, they're nano, they're bio, they're robo. They're kind of, you know, Darth Vadering up there and, you know, and, and living in this kind of, you know, ecstatic uh, cosmic detachment, which is a beloved theme in science fiction. But my hero, refuses to go without his horse. <laughs> he actually feels this deep emotional attachment to his horse, or he feigns a deep emotional attachment to his horse, or he proclaims a deep emotional attachment to his horse. And when everybody asks him, as they continually do, when are you lining up to be shot into outer space, he says, well, my horse is going with me. You know, I don't mind being post-human, but my horse also has to become post-equine. And you know, and and it, it, you know, this is actually a, um, you know, it's a, a, a frame-breaking uh, effort that this guy does because you know, within the uh, traditional thematics of science fiction and space exploration, you would never see a space horse, right? You know, and and, and the idea sounds quite absurd, but you know, if you think about it, from you know, the kind of theme you're talking about, the relationships of humans to animals and so forth. Why would we really desire to live in an environment which could not support a horse? <laughs> you know, I mean, not that we necessarily need horses. I'm not hung up on horses in particular. I mean, the horse is, in fact, an invasive species in North America. They were brought over by pioneers from Europe. And this guy's horse is a pioneer Mustang. And, you know, he's, he's very keen on this kind of Western, you know, Western film kind of, you know, allegiance to the horse, which is, you know, all about human beings projecting themselves onto, you know, the loyalty and the love of the animal and so forth and so on. But nevertheless, you know, there actually is a conceptual problem there. I mean, what do we think we will achieve by becoming astronauts without any of our accompanying fellow species. I mean, okay, we can probably survive in situations that are hostile to them, like we can survive in submarines, polar stations, or whatever, but is that really something that we aspire to? And, you know, and if we really plan to make ourselves, you know, post-human, let's say we want to boost our intelligence, live to be 500 years, you know, cyberpunk out with all kinds of ducts and injected glands and so forth and so on, you know, what about what about the cat? <laughs> you know? And you know, this is this is like really a post-human issue, you know, and, and, and if the post-human that your term you're using is more like the post-human term in you know critical philosophy, which I'm very sympathetic with and I understand that. But if you look up post-human on Google, what you normally see is a very science fictionalized discourse of extropians <clears throat> of you know, people wanting to like melt down their brains, you know, turn their thought processes into software and upload themselves into cyberspace in order to kind of be free of the burden of the meat, as William Gibson put it in his books from, you know, several, several decades ago. I mean, it's a classic kind of cyberpunk trope. But why would human beings go onto the internet and not domestic animals? Because if you actually look at the internet, it's crammed full of cats. <laughs> They're all over the place, you know. And, and and speaking, you know, as a scientific and engineering exercise, you know, if like if you're actually going to scan a brain, and turn it into data and upload it, obviously you're going to do lab animals first. There's no reason you can't put a cat into that situation. You know, pet, cats are in fact excellent experimental lab animals. We do all kinds of amazing things to mice, cats, etc. I mean, they're, they're sending mice into the International Space Station now 
which are you know, genetic mutant mice who have been bred to resist the dwindling effects of gravity. I mean, if you, if, you put an an, if you put an animal, including a human being, into zero gravity, their bones and muscles begin to dwindle away because they lack the exercise of being in a gravity field. So they have now, they're now sent, they have sent some mice to the International Space Station who have been genetically mutated in a way that their muscle will not dwindle away. And they're going to be spending quite a lot of time on the space station, you know, most of the lifespan of a mouse. And they're going to test them to see if these genetically mod mod modified organisms can actually survive in space. OK, we'll do the same to ourselves if that works out. They actually are pioneers of a post-human practice. I mean, we are testing the mice. The mice are going to go through it first. And the cats will go through it first. And everything that we do to human beings in any kind of post-human, extropian fashion will be pioneered on animals first. Hundreds of lab animals, thousands, will be sacrificed in these efforts before we ever dare to try such a thing on ourselves. And you know, in this story, I kind of like make that a bit clearer. And you know, it's, um, I think that's what makes it a modern story. You know, it may not be one of my best, but it's actually about the themes you're, you're being raised here. And, and it's, it's odd that it's about post-humans, geoesthetics, and field work. But that's, in fact, exactly what it is. What about my internet cat? <laughs> you know, I mean, our domestic life, life stock are with us at all times. And you know, whatever it is we're going to do to ourselves in the near future, the Internet of Things, for instance, which is a particular hobby horse of mine, you know, if you're in an Internet of Things home, the cat's going to be part of of that environment. I mean, you know, you'll have to re-engineer the house to watch the cat and the dog. And you can see this happening already. There are apps for cats, you know, tracing things for cats. Many of the uh, things that we use for ourselves are being applied to domestic animals already. It's like, where's kitty? Why don't we just put a cell phone on his collar? You know, you, you can see these applications already appearing, in, uh, you know, um, on our animal friends. You know, and there are things that are considered High tech, the Fitbit, for instance. You know, what about the kitty's Fitbit? <laughs> you know, and you have like this kind of complete control over the diet of your domestic animals, when they get up, where they go, where they sleep, and so forth. You're basically in the position to your cat that you are to say Zuckerberg <laughs> when you're when you're on Facebook. You know, you're 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 in a position where you can uh, you know domestic you can you can uh, cybernetically observe the animal at all times. And, you know, and really kind of change its behavior in a way that has never been done before. And I'm nudging them, you know. And, 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 and an interesting set of things, you know, and, and you don't really see much science fiction written about this, but it's because of the blind spot that you're actually addressing in your event here. I mean, we didn't catch on, you know. We're, we didn't see that. We didn't, we didn't understand the actual that the animals are stakeholders in these processes. They really are going to be in the Internet of Things exactly like they're in the Internet right now, and even more so. And they're going to be on the lab. And you know, if we ever actually live in space, there will be horses in space. People will demand them eventually. You know, they're not going to be content to live in a sealed pneumatic tube. Eventually, they're going to build really big environments and just go ahead and terraform them and kind of like drag stuff on up there and just pull out the full land art stops, you know? They're just going <laughs> to literally rebuild whatever environment they think is going to work, and it will have the full panoply of whatever the landscape engineers think is attractive. So now I want to show you this other artifact, which I also think has a lot to do with you and your sensibility and your zeitgeist. And this also arrived quite recently. I just plucked it out of my mail this week, and it's called the In Vitro Meat Cookbook. Beautifully illustrated, this book is half fiction, half scientific inquiry, says Wired Magazine. A bizarre cookbook from which you cannot cook, says Vice website. Playing the what if game to get people talking about their food and the future, says ABC News, with the lab grown hamburger and 45 other recipes. So it's actually a recipe book, but it's a recipe book for forms of meat that are grown in vitro cruelty-free, non-animal-based meat products. 
Hello, meat lovers. Hello, vegetarians. We need to talk about the future of meat. With the world's population expected to reach 9 billion by 2050, it becomes impossible to produce and consume meat like we do today. In vitro meat, grown from cells in a laboratory, could provide a sustainable and animal-friendly alternative. We're actually like changing our relationship to animals here, right? It's like, yet before we can decide if we are willing to eat in vitro, we must explore the new food culture it will bring us. This cookbook presents 45 recipes that explore and visualize what in vitro meat products might be on our plate one day. So you know you can immediately page through the thing. And it's like done with fanatical attention to detail. Cruelty-free pet food, marrow egg, cuppet, beefs, instant soup, vegan gelatin, and so forth and so on. You know, and there's no kind of painful lecturing in here. On the contrary, it's put together with a great deal of graphic design sophistication because it comes from the Next Nature group in Holland, nextnature.org, who are bloggers and graphic designers and engineers and pranksters and all Dutch. And, <laughs> and, you, know, and you would think there would be some huge you know, cultural division between Nevada and Holland because you know, they've got all the water and you have none. But actually, Holland is very much a man-made landscape. You know, it's like God made the world, but the Dutch made Holland. And they have, this, they have this awareness of the artificiality of their state, you know, with like the pumps always sort of wheezing and the seas rising. And, you know, they're, they're very good at sort of uh, taking over these sandy polder and turning them into butter factories and, you know, and the cattle and the clogs and the tulips and the whole <laughs> nine yards. But, you know, they're aware of its artificiality and basically the land art aspects of Holland. But, you know, that, that it's, it's not what Holland should be. I mean, Holland literally is a marsh. I mean, it's just a sandy set of, you know, river mouths. It's a bunch of flat deltas. But, you know, the, the people who, who, are, who wrote this book are, I think, keenly aware of that situation. And they're, they're like trying to find a way to come to terms with it and kind of creatively explore it. And they do it in, in rather a sarcastic way. I mean, there's, you know, it is a bizarre kind of cookbook, but it's quite bizarre in the way that many of your installations upstairs are bizarre. You know, I mean, they're, they're actually meant to sort of shock and unsettle, but they're, they're frame-breaking devices, right? It's like, wait a minute, the garbage is full of raccoons. Well, you know, the garbage actually kind of is full of raccoons, and you know, the Dutch garbage has got their own kind of version of this situation. And, uh, you know, they're, they're very into geo-aesthetics in some ways because, you know, Holland is an artificial landscape and it has an aesthetic of tulips, flatness, windmills. It's, everything in there is designed to look a particular way. There is no wilderness in Holland. I mean, even the stuff that looks like wilderness is merely an installation <laughs> of some kind. And they're post-human because, you know, once you start eating in vitro meat, you're obviously taking this stuff into your body. I mean, you're, you're remaking yourself with this entire new set of nutrients, which may be better for you than, you know, actual slaughtered animals, right? I mean, if they're produced under controlled conditions and, you know, the, the nutrient basis in this material, whatever it is, ground up crickets, I don't know, you know, cruelty-free cricket flesh, you know, might in fact be a nutritional advance, right? I mean, you might live longer. You might, you might be healthier with this kind of food, you know? I mean, red meat can be bad for you in some ways. And they're doing a lot of field work, mostly because it's not a work of science fiction. It's, uh, it's a cookbook, you know? They're actually sort of like putting it right on the table. You know, it's, it's like confrontational in a new kind of way. It's a, it's a cultural intervention. It's not an artwork, right? And it's not, it's not a book, which is like the book of a blog. It's, uh, what it is is basically a work of design fiction. It's a, um, it's a diegetic prototype, <laughs> which is, you know, a, a deliberate, sort of artifact that tells a future world without telling a story. Um, so, you know, the post-livestock post animal in vitro is a, 
is a diegetic prototype. It's like if you imagine it's actually there and you imagine it as part of like say a meat sherbet, you know. Well, yeah, you know, and you sort of go ooh at first and then you realize, wait a minute, why isn't a beef stew a meat sherbet? I mean, it's very similar, isn't it? And there's lots of ground meat soups that are basically, I mean, they could be brewed in some way. They could be a meat brewery, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if it was put on the plate, a blind taste test, you'd be, you'd be just fine. So why are you having this ooh reaction? You know, maybe you should like reconsider that and kind of like get over yourself a little bit. <laughs> you know, you're eating the unnatural, but it's post-cruelty meat. I mean, why is cruelty natural? I mean, there's a chicken, but you know, that chicken has to go through holy hell to end up on your plate. Is that proper, you know? Not to mention that in theory you could eat a lot of kinds of meat that you can't eat now, like say panda. <laughs> panda burgers. You know, you just like painlessly take a tissue sample from the panda, you brew up 30, 40 kilograms of the stuff, you're ready to go, you know, panda bacon, <laughs> panda whatever, you know, it's like panda and tofu for you Chinese food fans. You know, it would be a culinary experience you could never have under the current regime. <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're attempting to change the parameters of your thinking with these, these kinds of stunts. And, you know, as a science fiction writer, I appreciate it. It's not literary. It's not really what we do. But, you know, it's sort of allied to what we do. And it's kind of a, a creme de la creme, kind of a bouillon version of, like, science fiction gimmicks and gadgets. It's just that they've assembled it with much more attention to detail as designers because they in fact are designers and science fiction writers are not designers. We usually deploy these things for dramatic effect. They're like lightsabers, you know, it's like, wow, wish I had one. Whereas, you know, a panda burger is like a different kind of intervention. It's, um, you know, it's, it's comical in some ways but unsettling in kind of a subtler fashion and will probably stick with you more than the lightsaber, which is, you know, basically for 14-year-old boys. So, you know, I, I, I find this very interesting. I mean, I'm, I happen to be, I got a copy of this, not because I wrote anything for it, although I have written things for them before. I got a copy because I crowdfunded it, which is, you know, a strange kind of publishing intervention. And you would wonder, is it really going to jump off the shelf, you know? like. A, it doesn't have to. It's already sort of signed up, you know? I mean, people who wanted it got one. And it's actually kind of a nice artifact. I mean, it's not huge, but it's kind of hitting, it's hitting an audience that, you know, of people who are sort of committed to the ideas. And it's got kind of, you know, I mean, it's an elite, but it's kind of the proper elite to be talking to. And then who knows, it might become big. You know, you, you never can tell where a thing like that will break out through social media or somehow, you know, turn into the next, uh, you know, shades of gray or whatever, you know. <laughs> that happens nowadays. I mean, it's a catalog, it's a cookbook, it's not a fiction bestseller. But, you know, I look at these two things and I, brought, I, I bring them here because I think your institution could easily do either of these things. I mean, if you wanted to go in these directions, you wanted to like, get a bunch of land artists and some writers together and do like a cool thing of fictional land art kind of stuff. You could afford it, you know, it wouldn't cost you that much, you know, famous guys would be happy to do it. I would help you out, you know. <laughs> Why not, you know, I edit stuff now. I'm editing technology review, they do a science fiction thing. I'd like to have some land art fiction and technology review. Uh, so you could do that, and then, or you could do a thing like this. It's not that far from the book you've actually done. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of similar. But what you could also do, which you haven't really done, is like land art fiction, which would be things that are land art but don't really quite exist. Kind of a steampunk version of land art. Instead of like bringing out the bulldozers and the dynamite, it's more like they're lightweight Christo wrapping. You know, it's just like a temporary kind of land art intervention where you like can invent this um, assumed temporary autonomous zone like Burning Man and just like hit a couple of city blocks over a weekend, uh, you know, and, but, but you know, really kind of fake it out. I mean, really, you know, design it up so it like, looks super different, you know. But you have like great expertise in this area. 
You can sort of like throw the thing up, blow people's minds, peel the shrink wrap off, document it online, and just sort of vanish over the horizon. <laughs> no, which, is, which is the advantage of doing design fiction rather than design. If you really design something, you gotta sell it, keep it in stock, you know, fight off the lawyers. You know, if you, you know, and doing land art is also quite difficult. You gotta acquire the land, you know. Make sure that state troopers don't get made, you know, safety workers, everybody has to wear the hard hats. You know, if you're just sort of like doing this kind of uh, festival intervention, um, you know, I'm not recommending that you do it. I'm really pointing out that it's a lively possibility. You could get away with it, right? I mean, you know, this is not a huge thing, but they're actually opening up areas for expression that are also open to you. And I, my, my suspicion is that you would likely do a better job than these academics or these kind of Dutch pranksters, really. Because, you know, you're just more serious-minded people, frankly. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a network of influences happening here. You know, it's not really an accident that I show up at your event, even though I'm not a land art guy. I don't ever plan to do any land art. Uh, you know, I like events. Events are kind of the new magazines now. This is a very stimulating event for me. I learn a lot every three years. Uh, you know, forgive my artless gushing, uh, but I have to tell you that you really are wise people compared to the normal groups of people I hang out with. There's some, <laughs> no, really, there, you know, there's, there's something kind of deep about your community that don't show up in my usual hackers, makers, you know, sci-fi goon kind of weird, you know, <laughs> steampunk, cyberpunks. I mean, there, there's just a kind of gravity about your sensibility uh, and it has a kind of attractive broad scale and, and I think really a kind of unappreciated universality. I mean, you're meeting in a small town in the desert, but your topics are actually quite large. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of, um, uh, you know, warm and mind expanding, even though you, you, you share the fondness for monsters with us science fiction writers and these guys and, you know, you, you kind of like to shock. Nevertheless, there's a kind of authenticity to your community that I appreciate. I mean, land art in Nevada is like a real expression. It's like jazz in New Orleans. You know, it's just kind of a cool native thing that happens at this part of the world. And I don't think it's, a, it's an accident. Um, and I think you have friends you don't know you have. <laughs> so, you know, good luck in your future, your furry, vigorous, and dramatically monstrous animal future. <laughs>